All right, Pre-Calc students, um, I'm going to do a really quick video on uh, today's lesson, which is on applications of nonlinear parametric equations. What I'm going to do is take you through uh, a selection of examples. Uh, you'll see on the right of the screen here, I've actually got the worked solutions. And so what I want to do is just um, spend a little bit of time explaining, and then I'm going to uh, expand the right-hand side and show you the solutions uh, remember, the solutions are also on Google Drive, and so you can use that to check. So the aim of the video is really just to do uh, explanation of the main conceptual ideas for today's lessons and just use a few of the examples uh, to get those across clearly. Okay, first off, I'm going to take you through uh, the warm-up. And so uh, hopefully, if you were paying attention last class, you should be looking at this and recognizing that when our x and y relationships are in terms of trig functions, particularly in this case trig functions that have got different amplitudes, that what we're talking about rectangularly is uh, an ellipse. Okay, so the first part of the instruction uh, uh, tells us that we need to eliminate the parameter to write the equation in rectangular form. Uh, remember, we do that uh, in the same way as we eliminate uh, the parameter in lines or in anything else. So in this particular case, I'm going to start each of these by isolating the trig function. And so cos of t, x minus 1 over minus 4, uh, sine of t is going to be y plus 2 over 3. And then I'm going to use the trig identity, uh, sine squared t plus cos squared t is equal to 1. And so x minus 1 over minus 4 all squared plus y plus 2 over 3 all squared equals 1. And so uh, that's effectively the Pythagorean identity. And then the form we're probably a little more familiar with uh, is as follows. And that puts us in a position to now uh, sketch the graph. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and sketch the graph. So we have our uh, ellipse center is going to be at uh, 1 minus 2. So I'm going to go across 1 minus 2. Remember, the center of the ellipse is not actually a point on the graph. Uh, from that point, I want to go 4 left and 4 right for the uh, x values. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. And for the y values, 3 up and 3 down. And uh, that is going to be our ellipse. Okay, so that's our rectangular equation. Of course, what rectangular equations do not allow us to do is uh, to have the element of time. And so the value of parametric is that our, we can add the layer of parameter, which in this case is time, uh, or can be time. Uh, and that allows us to know uh, where the starting point of the graph is and at what point on the graph we are given a certain amount of time. And so in this particular case, uh, we clearly need to indicate the starting point and the direction. And so I've used the rectangular equation to sketch the graph. And now I need to be able to determine the starting point and the direction. My recommendation for you in order to do this is going to be always to consider the trig functions themselves. And so uh, we have the xt graph to begin with. Okay, And so I'm getting that xt graph from above over there. Uh, it's a negative cosine graph. And so it is starting at its minimum, which is going to be minus 3. The center line is going to be at 1, and the maximum is going to be at 5. Uh, and so this is our xt graph. And so our function is going from a minimum up to its maximum and back down to the minimum. Uh, given our domain of 0 to 2 pi, our trig graphs are completing a single uh, cycle, which graphically in terms of our rectangular function means we're tracing over the entire ellipse but only once. All right, let's do the same thing for the y equation. So I have my y axis and my t axis. If you look at our y function, uh, we have got a sine graph, a uh, positive sine graph. Amplitude is 3, center line is at minus 2. And so we have it oscillating uh, from a minimum of minus 5 up to a maximum of 1. Uh, and center line at minus 2. Uh, and so uh, in sketching the graphs of the trig functions, what it should allow you to do immediately is to ascertain the x and y coordinate of the starting point. So when t is 0, we have an x value of minus 3 and a y value of minus 2. And so x equals minus 3, y equals minus 2 
tells us that our starting point on our graph must be at minus 3, 2, and then we can look at uh, the trig functions to determine uh, whether we are moving in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction from the starting point. So let's start off, if we go over to the X graph over here, you can see we move from a minimum and go directly to the maximum. Uh, in the case of our graph, that doesn't tell us what we need because to get to our maximum, we could go either clockwise or counterclockwise. And so in this case, it is the Y graph that's going to tell us what we need. The Y graph, sorry, the Y graph starts at minus 2 and immediately goes up to its maximum. And that indicates that we must be traveling from the starting point in a clockwise direction. Okay, uh, that's a quick recap of... Uh, what we did last time. Uh, what we're moving on to now is today's lesson and essentially today's lesson uh, is an extension uh, of the lesson in which we introduced uh, the vertical motion of a projectile and so uh, probably you will remember the startled armadillo uh, that uh, we used the h of t um, vertical um, height or displacement function in order to model uh, the position of the armadillo at different times uh, from the moment it is startled until the moment it returns uh, to the ground. And so, uh, just a quick re recap, of course, this is our initial displacement or initial height, this is our initial velocity, uh, and our function, of course, is uh, modeling vertical motion, taking into account uh, the vertical uh, force of gravity, which is going to be acting on any projectile. Okay, so I'm going to move here to what we're facing today and now what you should notice is that we are no longer dealing with motion which is exclusively vertical. Now we have our projectile and the projectile will still have an initial velocity but that velocity is now angled and so it's at no longer at 90 degrees to the ground and so now we need to consider uh, the horizontal and vertical components of that vector. Okay, so I'm going to begin by drawing uh, a right triangle. Uh, what we have here is our initial speed of 125 feet per second uh, is our uh, hypotenuse of the right triangle with which we have a 40 degree angle that we're making with the horizontal, with the ground. Uh, I'm going to use some uh, pretty basic right triangle trig in order to determine the vertical and the horizontal components of our velocity vector. Okay, and so I'll just show a little bit of working for one. Uh, if I say um, uh, cosine of 40 degrees is equal to adjacent, which is V of X over hypotenuse 125, I rearrange that equation, I will get V of X equals 125 cos of 40 degrees. Similarly, uh, I can get the uh, Y velocity component as 125 sine of 40 degrees, again using Sokotoa, relatively straightforward um, in terms of just using um, your right triangle trick. Okay, next thing we need to do is to realize that those are uh, velocity, and so now we're going to write uh, our displacement uh, equations, and so uh, we're going to write our, uh, sorry, our x of t equation, which is going to represent the horizontal displacement uh, in this case, the, uh, we're attempting to model the uh, flight of a pumpkin. Uh, the flight of the pumpkin uh, obviously has a vertical and a horizontal component. Uh, the horizontal component, uh, the speed that we're talking about, or rather the velocity that we're talking about is 125 cos 40 degrees, is the horizontal component of our uh, initial velocity. Um, and that is, of course, a function of time. So if we want to know how far... Uh, the pumpkin has traveled horizontally, uh, then we are going to substitute in different time values and that'll tell us how far it's traveled horizontally. Uh, to model uh, the vertical uh, displacement, we are going to use our vertical displacement function, uh, and so minus 16 t squared. Of course, this is to account for the fact that gravity will act on uh, the vertical component and not on the horizontal component, so we have minus 16 t squared plus um, our initial uh, uh, vertical velocity, which we have uh, figured out is 125 sine 40 degrees t, uh, plus uh, our 25 feet, which accounts for 
our initial uh, displacement, uh, the pumpkin is fired from a height of 25 feet. So what we're able to do in this particular case is now uh, model these parametrically. It would allow us to know, for instance, at different times what the height of the pumpkin is and how far it has traveled horizontally. Okay, and so let's move on to part B. We're now being asked how far did the pumpkin travel? Uh, and so, uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm just going to give you the procedure and then I'll show you the solution. So if we want to know how far the pumpkin traveled, uh, hopefully if you see the visual, what you should realize is uh, we're only interested in uh, the moment that the pumpkin makes first contact with the ground, just like when you do the long jump, the first contact you make with the sand is where they measure your distance. And so we're not concerned about whether the pumpkin bounces or rolls. Uh, the moment it makes contact with the ground, which of course will occur when the vertical displacement function is at zero. If you solve, so these are all calculator questions, if you solve uh, for that, you're going to obtain uh, the time uh, when displacement is zero, uh, and if you take that uh, time when displacement is zero and substitute it in to the x function, the horizontal displacement function, it will yield the distance uh, uh, that the pumpkin has traveled. And so I'm going to zoom in here uh, if you need the answers. So basically what we've done is I've graphed the uh, y function, the vertical displacement function. I've obtained my zero, which is at approximately 5.3157 seconds. I substitute that value into the x horizontal displacement function, and that yields the distance that the pumpkin traveled uh, horizontally 509.0095 uh, feet. Okay, so pretty much that's the main conceptual idea. What I want to do now is look at example three. Um, the reason I'm skipping example two is that it doesn't really add any additional components to anything that I've already discussed. Really what I have to discuss now is what is new or what is different about example three. And so there's really just two things I'm going to take care of uh, part A and I'm going to take care of part D just to make sure we've I've highlighted uh, the main conceptual ideas. Okay, so uh, once again this time I'm going to go a little bit faster just in the interest of time so I need parametric equations that simulate the path of the baseball with respect to time so of course I'm looking for an x of t function and a y of t function uh, that are going to represent a horizontal and vertical uh, displacement respectively. Let's pick out a few of the details. Uh, uh, Nick is hitting our baseball three feet above the ground, so that's going to be our initial vertical displacement. This is going to be the angle that we're going to use in our right triangle to resolve the uh, uh, vertical and horizontal uh, velocities. Uh, our initial speed, 150 feet per second, is going to be the hypotenuse of our right triangle. And this is the additional element that we need you to pay attention to. Okay, and so what we're trying to do is add an additional detail into our model to try to take into account some uh, additional forces that might be acting uh, on the baseball. And so uh, you need to understand that we're going to model this at a fairly simplistic level because to model it more accurately uh, requires math beyond uh, the scope of the course. And so uh, we do want to try to improve our model, but understand that the model is still limited like most mathematical models are. Okay, and so what we're really trying to get you to understand is if I had uh, wind blowing straight back uh, in from the center field, just like gravity affects the horizontal component, uh, this wind is going to affect, uh, sorry, just like gravity affects the vertical component, uh, this wind is going to affect uh, the horizontal velocity uh, component and so uh, it's going to work as follows. So our x of t equation again if I were to just very quickly sketch my right triangle this is 25 degrees in here this is 150 and so the x velocity is going to be 150 cosine 25 degrees and this is the effect of the wind minus since we're working uh, everything in feet per second I'm going to use the 8.8 .8 and multiply that by t, and this is our um, horizontal displacement function, uh, and you can see the effect uh, of the wind that has blown straight back in from center field, i.e. Uh, slowing the ball down in terms of the 
the horizontal velocity. Uh, okay, in terms of our vertical, uh, we're now going to do uh, very similarly from what we did above, minus 16 uh, t squared plus 150 sine 25 degrees multiplied by t uh, plus our initial vertical displacement of 3 feet. Okay, so how long before the ball hits the ground? Same thing, uh, y of t equals 0. Uh, how far will the ball travel? So whatever answer we got from that is going to be substituted into the x equation, and that's going to yield that. Uh, what we're interested in here is uh, a small extension or application. And so if the center field fence is 10 feet high and 400 feet from home plate, uh, will Nick get a home run? Okay, so those of you who are not fans of baseball, of course, uh, what Nick needs to do is he needs to ensure that the ball flies over the 10-foot fence in order for him uh, to get his home run. Okay, and so what we're really interested in figuring out is with these uh, displacement functions, has Nick hit the ball hard, high, and far enough to fly over the fence? Okay, I'm going to explain a couple of ways you can approach this. They're more or less the same way. Um, uh, conceptually the same idea but a slightly different approach. Approach number one, I can take the y of t function and I can determine when, notice the emphasis, when the height of the ball is 10 feet. At the moment the height of, ball, of the ball is 10 feet, this will yield a time value. I can then take that time value, substitute into the x equation, and that will allow me to know at the moment that the ball is 10 feet high, how far it has traveled horizontally. If the value that I obtained exceeds 400, that indicates that the ball has already flown over the center field fence by the time it's coming down. Okay, alternatively, exact same idea. We can take the x of t function and we can determine the time when the ball has traveled horizontally 400 feet. We can then take that time, the time value that we obtain, substitute it into the y equation, and determine if the value we obtain is at least 10 feet. Both of these will achieve the same result, i.e. allow us to conclude whether or not Nick has managed to get his home run. Okay, and so calculator stuff, I'll just flash over really quickly to uh, the answer. And so here uh, you can see in my function, I've used the y of t, I've used... Uh, a height of 10 feet. I've determined the time when the ball is 10 feet above the ground and I've substituted that into the x in order to determine the horizontal displacement at the moment that the ball is 10 feet. This exceeds 400 feet by some ways and therefore allows me to conclude that yes he would have in fact uh, got a home run. Okay, last example uh, and so, welcome back to the Ferris wheels. Uh, exactly the same idea. We can, of course, uh, use uh, uh, trig functions to model the Ferris wheel. What we're attempting to do is layer on the idea uh, of time so that we can find the location of a point on the Ferris wheel, a rider, etc., um, uh, given a specific time. Similarly, uh, uh, paddle boat problems, this is exactly the same idea. Uh, and so what I'm going to do this time is I'll just do the uh, paddle boat problem. Uh, when you set the paddle boat problem up, first things first, what we're going to do is work the problem uh, as if this is our y-axis. And so uh, what we're really trying to do is find uh, a set of parametric equations and we are essentially using uh, a circle. And so our x values are going to oscillate between, so let's go over here, Diameter is 26 feet, which means we've got a radius of 13, which should tell us that the x values are going to oscillate between minus 13 and 13 from minimum to maximum. Uh, and again, uh, what I'm going to do in this particular case, as I did in the very first example, right? And so we're more or less doing the same thing as we did in the warm up example. Here we had an ellipse, uh, here we're dealing with a circle, and so I'm going to use the trig graphs to allow me to have a very clear picture of what the starting value is and the direction and in turn what the um, parametric equations should be. Okay, and so we've got our xt graph. Uh, the center line is going to be at zero. And so this is the x coordinate 
relative to time. Okay, uh, we've got to get a little more information bec before we can sketch our graph. So I'm just going to do the axes for my y as well. So we know that we've got uh, radii of a radius of 13. Uh, we make one revolution clockwise. So pay attention, that's giving us our direction every two seconds. Okay, so the paddle wheel is moving pretty fast. Let's deal with the period. Period is equal to 2 pi over n. In this case, we're being told that the period is 2 seconds, and that allows us to determine that our n value is going to be pi. And notice also that we are now working in radians. And so, yes, this is all calculator questions, but you're going to need to be paying attention to the fact that we're working in degrees uh, with our uh, horizontal and vertical displacement model, but now we're switching to radians. And so you're going to need to remember that when you are doing your assessments. Okay, so we've got our n value. Uh, we also need some more information. And so we have the center of the paddle wheel sits three feet above uh, the uh, surface of the water. And so that indicates that when we look at our y, we know that it's going up 13, plus it's sitting three feet above. So we're going to have a y maximum of 16, and we're going to have a y minimum of minus 10 and our center line is going to be at 3 so again uh, 16 uh, down to 3 down to minus 10 which of course indicates that uh, the paddle is entering uh, the water okay so let me just remove that all right uh, okay I'm just gonna put in my uh, center line over here and of course this is also a yt function a uh, little more information uh, that we have, and that is we need to uh, be told where our uh, starting point is in this particular case. So we're trying to model the position of point A, and we are told that at time zero, it's at the top of the wheel. And so that, of course, is significant because it's going to give us the starting point, namely x equals zero, y is equal to 16, and that, of course, is going to tell us that the y function is going to be a, a cosine graph and that our x function which of course is oscillating from minus 13 to 13 uh, is going to start at zero uh, and then we need to take into account finally our direction if we're moving in a clockwise direction that means we're moving uh, this uh, a value is going to move immediately towards the x maximum and so that's of course significant because that tells us that it is going to be a positive sine graph as opposed to a negative sine graph. Okay, we're now in a position to write our uh, parametric uh, equations. And so we've got our x coordinates in terms of time, 13 sine pi t. And we have our y coordinate uh, in terms of time, 13 cosine pi t. Uh, plus 3 to account for the fact that our center line uh, is at 3. Okay, uh, and then the last little piece is nothing uh, particularly new. How far has point A, which is fixed on the wheel, moved in one minute? In this particular case, uh, we know that one minute is going to be um, 30, uh, so one minute, 60 seconds, divided by the two seconds means uh, 30 revolutions. And if we want to know how far it's moved, of course, that is going to involve a calculation of the circumference and then multiply by 30. Okay, hopefully uh, that will give you enough to be able to try the other examples uh, and the assignment yourself. Uh,